Hey guys, what's going on? This is Travis P11. I want to welcome you back to the channel. Well guys, today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this very cool uh, Feather USA RAV 45 ACP carbine rifle. Um, it's kind of a takedown model where you can break it down into certain components and uh, make it for easy transport. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to let you know that this firearm is on loan to me from Stan, the owner of SS Pond in Lexington, Nebraska. Guys, I want you to give SS Pond a call if you're looking for any firearms and Stan will take care of your firearms needs. Uh, Stan loans me these firearms out of his private collection. And I usually take them home, do a cleaning video, take them to the range, do a tabletop video, and uh, bring them back uh, whenever I'm ready, which is really cool. So guys, do give SS Pond a call, and they will definitely help you out. All right, so back to the firearm. What do I know about this gun? I know very little about this firearm. Uh, there's just not a ton of information out there. In fact, when you go to the website for the company, there's really not even that much there. There's a few spare parts that they sell. There's no manuals available for download. There's really no links you can click on to buy anything, except for like a buffer repair kit. Um, there's a third party that does repairs for this particular firearm. So real quick, just a little bit of a history about this gun. So in 1995, uh, Feather Industries went out of business. This is taken directly from FeatherUSA.com. Uh, Feather USA was formed building the same style rifles with Uzi style mags for the 9mm and 45 ACP. So I guess Feather Industries was a prior company making this style of gun, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, and then it says, then in 2008, Feather USA changed everything with the ability to use a standard Glock magazine in any of the centerfire rifles. Okay, so this is a Glock magazine fed 45 ACP carbine. All right, so let's go ahead and check out what you would get if you had purchased the deluxe kit. I'm assuming it didn't come with all these accessories back in the day. And uh, all the magazines you're going to see are Glock, as, uh, but the, the 227 round uh, magazines are some sort of other brand. Not sure exactly what they are. So first of all, go ahead and open this up. Okay, so when you open it up, you're basically greeted with your uh, Glock magazines or a place where you can put your Glock magazines or whatever magazines you, you might be using, Glock compatible magazines. Uh, you've also got your A2 style uh, rear buffer tube. I'm assuming it's mil spec. This is an uh, Israeli made stock. I don't know if it's IWI or who makes this particular stock, but uh, again, very heavy duty, very rugged. You can tell it's seen a little bit of use. It is painted uh, plastic or polymer, whatever you want to call it. Um, it is basically uh, preset to be screwed on like this, okay, on the rear receiver of the carbine. The problem with that is that when it finally locks down, it's like this. It's like, it's like offset at like a quarter of an inch, which is really annoying. It makes it hard to use. And also it raises you up an inch so you basically can't even use the iron sights on the, on the firearm, which is not a problem if you have an optic or if you're using, you know, like, like a scope or some sort of a red dot. Um, and unfortunately you say, well, just make an adjustment. Can't you adjust this? This particular part, okay, once you move this uh, swivel sling band out of the way, this particular loop right here is actually staked into the uh, buffer tube. So you can't, you can't turn this at all unless you take the staking out. And since this is not my firearm, I was not about to do that. So it is adjustable for, for you know, for comfort. I mean, it is definitely cool. I mean, I, it definitely would, would make the gun, I would say even more usable than it already is. So that was an accessory that you could purchase for the firearm when it came out. Okay, obviously, like I said, you've got your Glock mags. We're looking at 13 round mags, okay. And so you have that. Now I'm gonna talk about what happened with my range experience uh, in just a little bit here. Then we got your 27 round mags. I don't know what brand these are. You guys could probably identify them. Are these Tapco or these Pro Mag? That just says, uh, oh, what do we got here? There's a plus on the top and then 26 RDS for 26 rounds. So I really can't tell you uh, who makes these. I don't really know a lot about pistol caliber carbines to be honest with you guys. Um, and then you've got your, your barrel, and we're actually going to measure the barrel because I'm just kind of curious to see if it was a 16-inch barrel or a 17-inch barrel. Um, the barrel shroud is a separate part, and, okay, really easy to transport, which is really cool. All right, I'm going to take that out. All right, so this is your barrel, okay, very heavy-duty piece. If you watch the cleaning video, you can see that we took it out. you got your feed ramp right there. Try to give you all the different angles of this thing. It's pretty pretty much idiot proof when you assemble it, although I did have some issues at the range with it when I took it out. Very heavy, thick barrel. Let's get that. Yeah, I think we're gonna have some trouble focusing. All right, so anyway, again, it's 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 definitely got some heft to it. It's definitely got some weight, which I would say contributed to a very low amount of recoil that I, that I felt when I was shooting it at the range. Got a little lug up here that goes into the slot on the top of your upper receiver that locks the barrel into place before you uh, assemble it and put the barrel band over the front. Okay, then you've got your barrel shroud, which when you put it over, this actually takes the place of the barrel nut that you would normally use just to keep the barrel in place. You would take that nut off and then you would put this nut on. Well, the nut and the shroud. 
uh, over the barrel itself and it would uh, screw into place and screw the barrel back and you get kind of a cool like I mentioned previously in the range video kind of a faux suppressor look which is very sweet very cool okay let's go ahead and get those out of the way all right so real quick uh, barrel length I guess if we go from I don't know maybe we can consider this part over what are we looking at Suppose if you take it all the way back, you're going to get 17 inches. If you go to 16, which is basically what you need for it to be not considered an SBR, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you're right at 16 inches, which is essentially from the front of the round. Okay, but very, very heavy duty barrel. Great strong rifling in the barrel. Um, the, the rifling was in really good shape, although I can tell the, the, the firearms had some rounds put through it. Now, the actual firearm itself looks like something from Star Wars. And again, uh, you've got kind of check it out all the way around just really nice finish nice satin black finish I don't know if it's blued or just painted flat black but it seems like it's definitely held up over the years I'm assuming this is a 2008 model just because it's uh, chambered for the Glock mags okay checking that out it's just a blowback style you've got your wire stock mounted reverse and we'll take that out here in just a minute and put that on got your iron sights which really hard to use tiny peep no flip aperture to give you a wider field of view uh, just the front side, but I'm going to tell you right now, it was very accurate. The shots that I was shooting in the range video were, were pretty consistent. Uh, when I benched it, it was doing fine, aside from the fact that my uh, uh, lead sled kept moving on me. So again, you got your standard Picatinny rails, which is nice. You've got a little polymer uh, foregrip on here, hand guard. Hand guard. Uh, very smooth, just comfortable to grip. Thin, uh, narrow pistol grip. Okay, thin, I'm going to call it flimsy trigger, almost like something you'd almost see on a high point. I mean, very, I was like, God, please don't break. When I was shooting this thing, I was just like, oh, I hope that doesn't crack, but it's going to work. It's probably about a little over a quarter inch thick, I'm guessing. Not quite a half inch um, for, for the polymer itself, but it does clean up rather nicely. I won't be doing a disassembly in this particular video because you guys have already seen that if you watched it. So we'll go ahead and release the uh, wire stock here, and we'll go ahead and put that in. All right, come around the other side here. So again, the wire stock was really not that uncomfortable to shoot. When I would shoulder it, it was actually just perfectly comfortable. I mean, ergonomics are really not that bad on the firearm itself. It's very rude or entry, very simple. Some guys said it looks kind of like a Sten gun or a Bren gun or some sort of a grease gun, I guess. That's, I, I, I can see the, <laughs> the family resemblance, right? Okay, and it locks into place. It does have a little uh, shaft right here that goes through your wire stock and you just simply move this, uh, this little, this little knob right here. And that's what you use to release it. I did not separate the upper from lower. You can, I just didn't want to mess with it because there really isn't much you can service or much you can clean, uh, from the underside again, hollow grip. Okay. And, uh, again, uh, polymer, uh, polymer grip going on. This is very nice machining though. Very nice finish. We'll put a mag in there and just, uh, take a look at it here. Okay. Before I put the barrel on. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Not going to put a 33 rounder in there, but we'll go ahead and just take a Glock mag. There you go. Okay, it's in. Good to go. Sorry, I keep smacking the cameras. I'm working in kind of close quarters here. At the range, I had issues. I'm just going to say that right now. Um, we'll kind of take a look at this here. Pull back. Oh, let's go from the other side. It's got such a tight spring. And lock back the barrel or lock back the uh, the bolt you do have a fixed um, extractor or ejector in there which which looks fine I don't know if the extractor itself was getting a little bit weak and that's why what was happening is it would launch the first shell and then it would uh, ram the second round I think into the feed ramp I'm, I'm guessing it's a magazine issue and it would ram so hard it would basically push the bullet into the shell itself and um, it was pushing it in like a quarter of an inch. I mean, I was putting the bullets back in the box. I was just picking up on the ground. I'm like, wow, they shrunk somehow. And obviously they're not gonna be safe to fire, so I did not fire them through the firearm. So when I shot this, I had to just do single shots, just charging it uh, one shot at a time. Here we go, can we release that and go ahead and just do a dry fire. See, it's just real simple, real basic. Trigger itself is just a tiny, tiny bit of, bit of a tiny amount of movement to it. Really not that much. Uh, I'm not even going to mention reset. There's really no point. Um, and I mean, it, it just, it would, it would stay and boom, it would break. And that was it. I mean, it was really predictable. You could tell uh, when it was going to go off. Uh, recoil was pretty much non-existent. I mean, I can't explain the recoil impulse from a uh, 45 uh, caliber carbine firearm because it's really not that significant in this particular firearm. 
I'm going to say less than an AR. Um, almost kind of like maybe like a 410 shotgun recoil, definitely less than like a 20 gauge. Okay, so now here's the nut that you can take off. And if you're going to use the barrel shroud, which I'm not going to put on, but if you are, that takes the place of the regular nut that comes off the front. You do have a little button down here you have to push that keeps your threads in place with your barrel. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and seat the barrel. You know what? There's one thing I want to do first. I want to pull back. There we go. On the bolt. Before I put the barrel in. Because when I assembled the firearm the first time, I didn't. And I noticed that uh, receiver was pushing forward on the barrel. So then I field, you know, field stripped it and put it back together before I took it to the range. And I was thinking maybe that might have caused a problem. So, okay. All right, so it's in. All right, so something I want to talk about here. When I was watching my videos, you know, I, the barrel's correctly in. The lug is right where it needs to be. When I was watching my videos, I was thinking to myself, man, maybe, maybe I pushed the barrel too far back. I don't know. It was just odd. I was thinking, what did I do to cause it to malfunction? I mean, obviously, I was trying to blame user error because I had disassembled it completely uh, before I reassembled it. And, I, you know, I field stripped the gun out there again and put it back together, and it still did the same thing. I had one mag that functioned for that first uh, camera shot that I did where I did the four shots, and it actually malfunctioned on the fifth shot. So I'm assuming this is okay. You're looking at about an eighth of an inch or a quarter inch of, of barrel that's sitting back, right? I mean, it's in the lug up in the front. It can't go anywhere else. So I'm assuming that's the design. And the problem is, is I can't find any real good photos to show me if that's correct or not. I was thinking maybe that was just too far back, but it's gonna lock into one spot and it's not gonna go any further, okay? And this is your, um, oh, I don't think it's your, I don't know what that is. It's gonna be like a recoil rod. Oh, it's your recoil spring, I'm sorry. Okay, you go ahead and drop it and you can see it sits. I mean, it only has to cycle about that far to properly eject. It doesn't even have to go more than maybe halfway back. So, yeah, so I mean, I was getting light primer strikes. I was getting, uh, you know, dead primer strikes and so on. And I just, I just wasn't having very good luck um, overall with the firearm. So, I don't know, would I buy one? Yeah, definitely. I mean, from a collector standpoint, you know, they are rare. Um, there's not a lot of them for sale. In fact, I found one for sale and the auction, the ad was up from like, had been placed around 2014. The firearm had already sold. And the firearm was listed as $875. So, you know, if you want this as like a defensive pistol car, caliber carbine, I'm just gonna say go with an AR style. If you want one of these from like a collector standpoint, because they're very rare, they're very hard to find, they're very portable and very cool, and you can get it running, man, you go right ahead and buy one. Weight, oh man, I really don't know. I'm gonna say probably around six and a half pounds, maybe five and a half pounds. I don't know, it feels about the same as an AR. I mean, all of your weight is centered over that, that heavy, heavy um, bolt carrier group, okay? Yeah, so there you go. All right, so again, very cool little firearm. Um, very neat, rare. They made these in nine millimeter, they made them in 40, they made them in 10 millimeter and 357 SIG and 45 ACP. Uh, just kind of one of those, again, like I said, one of those little rare little tidbits of, of gun production that you just don't really seem to see much anymore. Now, it's weird because on the website, they are claiming that this uh, firearm is gonna go back into production. So, I don't know when that message was actually posted, if this was something that was posted recently or not. But it would be cool if they put them back in production because I consider buying one just because of the portability of it. It's just awesome. I mean, we're talking about a case that's half the, length of a tip, half the length of a typical rifle case, maybe even about a third. And it would be the ultimate truck gun or just kind of the ultimate, uh, just kind of portable all around defensive carbine. So there you go, guys. All right, so I'm going to get this uh, taken apart, get it cleaned up and get it back to stand at SS Pond. Uh, guys, I want to thank you for joining me today. Um, like I said, we're running about a 16, 16 and a half, 16, 17 inch barrel. Um, checking out the uh, RAV45 ACP uh, carbine by Feather Industries backslash Feather USA. Check out the uh, video. I'll definitely put links to it at the end of this video for you as soon as I can. And uh, you can check out the uh, tear down and cleaning video of this sweet firearm as well as the uh, range footage that I got. So uh, one thing real quick. <laughs> a lot of guys were, were having asking me, hey, I've had two or three guys message me, hey, when are you going to do that Ruger Precision um, test, that Ruger Precision rifle, when are you going to take that out? Um, it has been awful weather the last two weeks here in central Nebraska, like it is in all my videos. I know I complain about it a lot, but if you get to know people from Nebraska, all we really talk about is Nebraska football and the weather, because that's really all we have to do around here, uh, which is why I go to the range all the time. And it's been raining and wet and cold and windy. And I don't mind hunting in those conditions, but it's hard to want to sit at a wet bench and just shoot long distances. Plus, it's a mud pit trying to get out to 1,800 yards or 1,000 yards. 
it's just the road that we drive on is fine at the range, but when it's soaked, it's just a nightmare trying to get out there and you get just, just filthy doing the, the range test. So now that the sun's out, now that it's, it's sunny and it's warm, and we're about to get out of uh, school uh, for the summer, which is cool for me, it gives me some more free time. Uh, we will be taking this, well not this, we will be taking the Ruger Precision Rifle to the range. I know it has nothing to do with this video guys, but I just wanted to let you know that I will be making that video soon. It's just, it has not been cooperating weather as well as a lot of stuff going on on the weekends and, and us being busy with stuff, so there you go. Okay guys, so I want to thank you for joining me today and checking out this very cool review. Stan, I want to thank you for loaning me this firearm. It will be going back to you tomorrow, I believe. What's tomorrow? Thursday? Yeah. And uh, so there you have it guys, so please like or subscribe. Please tell your friends about the channel. Guys, make sure you tune in for Caliber Corner, which is coming up next Saturday at 8 a.m. It's going to be Caliber Corner number three. I don't know if I'm going to do them every week, but they are a lot of fun. I'll do them when I can. Um, and also check me out over on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, you can also find me over on Patreon. You can support the channel with uh, Travis P11. Or I'm sorry, www.patreon.com backslash Travis P11, as well as on gun channels with the Colt Caliber Corner. And finally, the Average Ordinary, I'm going to say the Ordinary Average Guy Gun Channel. So much to say in so little time. So there you have it. All right, guys. So thanks for joining in today. I want you to uh, check out the channel for more videos. Uh, and there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this uh, quick little tabletop review of this fun little carbine. All right, guys. Have a wonderful week. Have a great weekend. As you know, we will talk to you soon. Goodbye.